from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Josephine Reed from the National Endowment for the Arts. And on behalf of the Library of Congress, I'm here to welcome you to the 2013 National Book Festival. I hope you're having as good a day as I am, celebrating the joy of reading here on the National Mall. Before I begin, I want to inform you that the Pavilion's presentations are being filmed for the Library of Congress website and for their activities. So be mindful of this as you enjoy the presentation. And in addition, please don't sit on the camera risers that are located in the back of the pavilion. And when Manila's done reading, he'll take your questions. And if you have questions, please make sure you go to either microphones so they can be recorded. Well, I'm here to introduce the talented and multifaceted Manil Suri. For those of us sitting here in this tent, we know him as a best-selling, critically acclaimed novelist. But Manil is also a professor of mathematics at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And he is as passionate about mathematics as he is about fiction, which was made clear in the New York Times op-ed piece he wrote just last Monday. It's called How to Fall in Love with Math. And this is just a bit of what he wrote. As a mathematician, I can attest that my field is really about ideas above anything else. Ideas that inform our existence, that permeate our universe and beyond, that can surprise and enthrall. Perhaps the most intriguing of these is the way infinity is harnessed to deal with the finite. Just reflect on the infinite range of decibel numbers, a wonder product offered by mathematics to satisfy any measurement needed. Well. Manil was conveying the joys of math in that paragraph, but I realized it's also not a bad metaphor for his fiction. Manil Suri is a novelist who has given us three wonder products, teeming with ideas that have open worlds, populated with characters that surprise and enthrall. His unconventional trilogy, The Death of Vishnu, The Age of Shiva, and The City of Deve, isn't bound together by characters or circumstances, but rather by its use of Hindu gods as metaphor and the central role played by the city of Mumbai, Minil's birthplace. The death of Vishnu is set almost entirely in and around an apartment building where Vishnu, an odds job man, is dying on the landing. It sounds relentlessly grim, but it's not, as the first sentence of the book indicates. Not wanting to arouse Vishnu in case he hadn't died yet, Mrs. Azrani tiptoed down to the third step above the landing on which he lived, tea kettle in hand. And as a reader, I knew I was in good hands, and Manil did not disappoint. He co-mingles the tragic and comic with perception and wit, and the result is a story of extraordinary specificity with universal implications. If in Vishnu, Manil uses a finite setting to explore the infinite or universal, his second book, The Age of Shiva, is a sprawling family saga set in post-colonial India. It follows Mira beginning in the 1950s with her unhappy marriage through to her own son's coming of age, telling a deeply felt story with an all too human protagonist that combines the most intimate matters of the heart with the power of historical events to shape our lives. And then there's the third leg of the triangle. How to describe the recently published City of Deve. A dazzling novel, The City of Deve is a love story sex comedy set in an apocalyptic future. It's as rich in Hindu myth as it is in Bollywood lore. The book opens with India and Pakistan in a countdown to nuclear war. Internally, India is reeling from Muslim Hindu violence. People are fleeing a rubble-filled Mumbai, while dirty bombs explode around the country. In the midst of this chaos, Sarita looks for her husband, Karun, who's mysteriously vanished before all this craziness began. She's joined in her wanderings by Jazz, a flamboyantly gay, nominal Muslim, who's also searching for his own lover. Together, Sarita and Jazz narrate the roller coaster ride they take as the world goes careening to its end. That's the very bare bones of a multi layered plot of The City of Deve, which truly is one of the best books I've read in a very, very long time. 
If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, I really do envy you the experience of sitting down with that book for the first time. And now it's my deep pleasure to introduce its author, the master of the infinite and the finite, Manil Suri. See if this balances here. Well, so thank you, Joe, for that wonderful um, introduction. And uh, I just want to say, if any of you haven't read that New York Times article on, from Monday, it was actually aimed at non-mathematicians, and it actually became number one uh, emailed article for the day. Uh, and it would have been number one for the week, except uh, the Pope upstaged me. <laughs> So, you know, it was coming up, coming up, number three, number two, and then he had to make his comments and everything, and he just leapfrogged onto number one. So, oh well. But um, I'm going to start, uh, since you already heard a little bit about the book, I'm going to actually start by reading you just a little section from the beginning, and then I'll read a couple of other uh, sections and go along. Uh, so let me, let me start right at the beginning. Four days before the bomb, that is supposed to obliterate and kill us all. I stand in the ruins of Crawford Market, haggling with the lone remaining fruit seller over the price of the pomegranate in my hand. Is 500 rupees not an outrageous price already? Why won't you sell it to me for 500? Look at what's happening around you, Maim Sahib. Do you think the orchards are overflowing with pomegranates? Do you think the lorries are driving into Mumbai every day and filling the markets with fruit? I'm only asking for a thousand because it's you, Maim Sahib. But even three times that won't be too much for this last piece, which really was the best one in the pile to begin with. I look at the sign for Crawford Market behind me, still smoldering from last night's air raid. Or has it simply been another terrorist bomb? All around are shops gutted in the fire. Remains of baskets lie scattered on the ground. Pieces of fruit too charred for the scavengers to steal rest at my feet. I notice a tangerine that still has its characteristic knob at the top. It has been roasted to a black, perfectly whole crisp. Down the corridor, only one other stall stands intact. A spice merchant who has also somehow escaped the attack. He's using a stick to try and rouse the carcass of a dog that has died in front of his store. The fruit wala has a point. Supply and demand, he has me where he wants. This much I know. I must have the pomegranate before I begin my quest. Some instinct deep inside insists it's my best shot. But what's tied into the folds of her silk dupatta around my neck is a few hundred less than the fruit wala wants. But yeah, listen, I try once more. They're dropping the atom bomb this week. Atom bomb, you understand? Not some firecracker that's demolished the market around you on Bombay, Mumbai, whatever you call it, the city's going to be finished. What would you do even if you did manage to squeeze out the extra money from someone? Take it to heaven with you? And what if nobody else came to your store? Most of the city has fled, you know. Is this what you want to happen to your fruit? I nudge the tangerine with my foot, and it crumbles into ash. But the fruit while is adamant, he won't settle for less. It's all up to Devi Ma's grace, he says. She's the city's patron goddess, after all. Now that she's appeared in our midst, perhaps she'll save us, who knows? But even if she doesn't, even if she only lets me hold the money for 10 minutes, at least I'll have it for that much time. At least I'll die with an offering for her in my hand. Suddenly, the futility of what I'm trying to do overwhelms me. How ridiculous to put such hopes in a pomegranate. I look at the smoke billowing out of the buildings in the distance and smell the soot that hangs everywhere. The garbage collecting for days, the stench of bodies rotting in the air. Ever since I started my vigil for Karun 18 days ago, I've kept close to my building complex sheltered from the mayhem, trying not to obsess over where he might be now, why he left, with the internet dying out, together with phones, radio and television, even electricity, my only news about the outside has been through tidbits from our lone remaining watchmen. Seeing the devastation all around today fills me with disbelief. The city, as I knew and loved it, is gone. 
Somewhere towards Metro, a gun fires three times. Looters probably executed by the police, or perhaps by vigilantes. The police force, according to our watchmen, having also fled. I wonder what would happen if I bolted, wrapped the pomegranate in my dupatta, and leapt over the rubble that used to be at the entrance. Would the fruit wala run after me? Would the vigilantes fire at me as well? Surely their code of conduct must frown upon the gunning down of women. Perhaps the fruit wala sees the calculation in my face because he takes the pomegranate from my hand. He eyes me carefully and I see him appraising the Mangal Sutra I wear. Has it been two years already since our marriage when Karun tied it around, our neck, around my neck? I run the black beads through my fingers, I feel the gold pendant. What difference does it matter if I die with or without it? At least this way I feel I will have a chance. I take off the Mangal Sutra and hand it to the fruitwala. He drops the red and heavy orb that is to give me Karun back into my palm. So that's uh, Sarita and uh, Karun has disappeared. He's been gone for about two weeks. And um, this is the city of Mumbai, of Bombay. And you know, sometimes I actually try to get it here, but I have this PowerPoint that goes along with it. So luckily, I have it all memorized. So you know, each step of the way, I know what picture comes up next. So when I'm doing my PowerPoint, there's a nice map of Mumbai here, which is actually in the front of the book too. And if you look at the map of Mumbai, you'll see that it's a very narrow sort of uh, north-south axis. Uh, Mumbai used to be seven islands, and they were actually filled in. And so it's got water on almost all sides. Wherever you look, there's water. And Sarita is right at the bottom. She's in Kolaba, which is at the base, in the southern base. And uh, she has to find her husband, Karun, who the last time she heard from him was somewhere in the north suburbs. And so she has to find her way up uh, this, this uh, long uh, distance. And so uh, as she goes along, there are several elements that I sort of introduced. And you know, when you, when you start writing a book, these elements come to your mind and you say, OK, I'll put these in and I'll figure out what to do with them later. So the pomegranate is the first thing. And uh, that gave me a lot of problem uh, later on. Like right now, it was a very ripe symbol almost of lust and this and that. And you know, that sounded really tacky. So I had to figure out you know, what can I do to this pomegranate to make it uh, really have a completely different interpretation? So that's what uh, comes towards the end. She really finds out something from that. Uh, and then the next ingredient is something called Marmite. Have people, do, how many people have tasted Marmite? Oh, wow, this is amazing. Are you all Brits or something? <laughs> uh, you know, this is this black, yeasty substance. And it's basically hydrolyzed yeast protein. And it's one of the nastiest substances known to mankind. Um, but I grew up on it. You know, Being in India, we, we had Marmite and everything. And Sarita actually loves it. So there's, there's Marmite that goes along. And that also plays a key role in the, in the book. Um, interestingly, when, I, uh, when the book was being released before it, I went to my uh, publisher, and he had a a, a sort of uh, get together with all the staff and everything, and actually served little uh, hors d'oeuvres with Marmite on them to everyone. And very few people ate it. And finally, we <laughs> finally we forced the head of the pu publishing company to show how much he cared for the company, and so he had to eat it. So uh, that was that was not very successful. Um, so Marmite is the second ingredient, and uh, and 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 there's another ingredient which uh, which is an which is an elephant. And uh, it's Shamu the elephant. OK, why an elephant? Uh, I was told that every good Indian novel has to have an elephant. <laughs> and, and you know, as Joe told you, I've already written two novels, and uh, neither had an elephant. So I've been very remiss. So this is my way of making up for that. So there's an elephant in there, too, which is, you know, if you read my first two books, you'll notice that, OK, what is he up to? Like, where is he going with all this? And I was thinking the same thing, actually. Um, but there is an elephant, uh, and then and then there is uh, you know there's when I give my when I give my screen presentation, I've actually got little cutouts for uh, all the the three main characters, and um, what I did was I actually you know for Sarita I just used the uh, picture from the cover, uh, for uh, the second character Karun I decided to cut out a Bollywood film star. And so the guy I used was, you were mentioning Slumdog Millionaire. I used uh, Dave Patel's eyes. So, and, and most people actually um, see that. And I think he would make a good uh, Karun, actually. Um, 
And then, and then there's one more character, uh, not character, but one more ingredient, and that is the Super Devi. And if you were seeing my presentation, this was the point for the big special effect, because Super Devi kind of rushes onto the screen and zooms from one place to the other. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to Super Devi and uh, just read you a little section which will make clear what she, she is or did. Super Devi released that summer, deluging even non-movie people like us with its hype. The most expensive Indian film ever made, thanks to the backing of both Hollywood and the Indian mafia. Lata Mangeshkar teams up for her techno comeback with Lady Gaga, who my sister Uma said was a famous pop star. Their title duet rockets to the top of charts worldwide. And up in the sky, a bird, a jet, no Super Devi herself, zooming overhead behind a prop plane as we sat and tried to ignore her on the beach at Chopati. Supposedly, the script borrowed extensively from Slumdog Millionaire and Superman, films which neither of us had seen, in telling the story of a young girl from the Mumbai slums with the power to assume different avatars of Devi to fight crime. Uma kept herding us to McDonald's, which was giving away all nine incarnations from the movie as collectible action figures throughout India and parts of England and New Jersey. <laughs> Free with food purchases, vegetarian only so as not to upset Hindu sentiments. She collected eight of the figures, turning off the light at home to show us how they glowed in the dark, just like Super Devi. Despite foisting dozens of makalu tikki sandwiches on us, she never managed to acquire the elusive Kali incarnation, toting her AK-47 from the final battle scene. The movie managed to surpass even the most optimistic projections. I read breathless reports in magazines of kids, kids dragging their families to see it three and four and even 10 times of the urban youth of India finding spiritual enlightenment in Super Devi's incarnation as call center worker to fight telefraud. Of Desis in New York and London and Sydney bringing such gaggles of white friends to screenings that the film quickly spilled over to mainstream international release. A ZTV program documented how Super Devi wielded its greatest power over rural India, whose citizens experienced it not as movie but as religious odyssey calling the heroine Upar Devi, which translated to Upper Devi in several Indian languages. The reporter followed scores of villagers making pilgrimages from miles around to get the Super Devi's blessing at a small theater in Ambala, where both fire exits had been converted into Devi shrines for patrons to leave flowers, coconuts, and monetary offerings. Perhaps the most definitive evidence of the film's popularity appeared in the calendar art sold on city streets. All the goddesses from Lakshmi to Saraswati to Parvati bore a striking resemblance to Super Devi's child heroine, Baby Rinki. So that's uh, Super Devi, and it's a film that's based on uh, Devi, who's you know, in the title. And Devi, of course, stands for the mother goddess. Uh, she's one of the big deities in Hinduism. And Mumbai is actually named after her. Mumba means mother, and I means mother in Marathi. So um, she's sort of the overwhelming presence throughout this movie, throughout this book. And she's also uh, the star or the subject of this movie called Super Devi, which has been a big hit, but has also got a, a kind of uh, nasty effect going on, uh, an undercurrent of hatred that's being spread throughout the country, uh, where right-wing politicians are saying, you know, the Super Devi's message is to rid the country of all minorities. Um, and so there have been riots that have been breaking out and uh, a lot of um, mayhem between Hindus and Muslims. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, this is something that keeps cropping up in India. And if you read the news, unfortunately, there are things like that happening right now. Um, but Super Devi has, uh, the, 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 the book really looks at what would happen if this really went on uh, and really went beyond the bounds where it's usually reined in. 
Uh, and what's happened is, you know, Pakistan has stepped in and all this stuff is happening with a threat uh, and so on. So this is the, this is the, uh, this is the scenario under which uh, Sarita has to make her uh, journey to find Karun. The city has been split up and there are Muslim and Hindu gangs roving around. Well, into all this is uh, the final ingredient. And the final ingredient is my third character. And uh, since it is, you know, Joe was talking about trinities, so this is a definite trinity. Uh, and that third character is Jazz. And Jazz is someone for whom the city is very different. Jazz looks at the city, uh, and at, at this point I have pictures of Rousseau's uh, uh, etchings, his landscapes of tigers and so on. He looks at a city as a giant playground where he's always looking for prey. Uh, Jazz is a gay Muslim, and his parents have grown up, uh, have, have, um, have been, you know, they've written a scholarly uh, book on Islam, which has uh, really taken off and made them uh, huge stars in the academic world. And so he's been moved from country to country as he's been growing up. And uh, this is really kind of, you know, he, he doesn't know what's wrong with him. He's very upset. He's very uh, depressed. And on his 15th or 14th birthday, he finally finds a way of telling his parents that he, not, not everything is uh, OK with him. And you know, it, it'll sound very grisly when I tell you uh, what, what he does. Um, but the scene I'll read out right after is actually a very funny scene. Um, and uh, what, what happens is that uh, at, at, on his 15th birthday, he uh, pierces his tongue uh, with a pen and blows blood on his birthday cake just to tell his parents something is going wrong. I know, that sounds horrible. Sorry. <laughs> but, but the scene that follows is a scene that I was explicitly told never to read out, uh, especially when I went to India, uh, because Jazz is this gay character. And they said, OK, uh, Calcutta was the first stop that I made there. And they said, Calcutta is a very conservative city. So whatever you do, don't read out any of the jazz scenes, uh, especially not the, you know, the gay scenes. So naturally, that's exactly what I did. Uh, <laughs> And, and the thing is, I was very disappointed because, OK, two people walked out, I understand, which is good. But, um, but everyone else just sat there, was very blasé and everything. So it was like, OK, what's going on? And India has sort of changed a lot um, uh, in terms of you know, what's happening with acceptance of uh, diversity. Um, so anyway, I came back to the US. And the book was released in February this year in the US. And so. Um, uh, my president of the university introduced me at an event that I had at UMBC. And I invited all my uh, students to this event, uh, math students. And so uh, again, I, I said, well, what should I read out? I really can't read out this scene. And so I, but then when I, when I stood there, I said, OK, I have to read this out. So that's what I did there, too. So after reading it out to my students, you all are a piece of cake. So. Um, <laughs> That finally got their attention. My parents' solution was to move once more, to Mother India this time, which would unscramble my identity, fill my heart with pride in who I was, where I came from. That's how the young and still impressionable Jazz found himself sitting in the green-walled annex to the Baikula Mosque in Bombay, fitted with a skull cap and equipped with a Quran. Each evening, as the adults prayed upstairs, I stared at the paint peeling off the benches, trying to tune out the hadiths being explained by the imam. Could I escape again by piercing some other body part? Fortunately, my cousin Rahim, who attended the same class, had alternative plans for my edification. My parents, ever pressed for time, arranged for me to spend the evenings at his home afterwards. At 16, Rahim not only exceeded me in age, but also in girth. Good afternoon, everybody. I experienced his weight firsthand each time he sat on me at the end of our wrestling bouts. He insisted we strip down to our underwear like sumo wrestlers. His sweat marked my body, smelling of whatever spice lingered most dominantly from lunch. Rahim's mother had died a decade ago, and his father worked late, so we didn't have to worry about anyone supervising us. Soon we were undressing completely and wrestling in the buff. 
I'm not sure if my technique improved or if Rahim simply left me, but I started ending up on top more often than not. My thighs straddling his hips, my seat pressed into his crotch. Even though I left his hands free, he never pushed me off. One evening, I had the bright idea of slapping him in the face with my penis as we horsed around. He looked at me strangely, then leaned forward and took me in his mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, survivors of the coming October 19th Holocaust or future alien voyagers, this is where my journey takes its most dramatic turn. The before and after, the BC and the CE, the divine revelation that swept away all my baggage from the past. Suddenly, I didn't feel hopeless. Suddenly, I found myself in control. Suddenly, the answers to all my questions popped and burst like fireworks. My identity flashed on, my confidence powered up, the path to my fulfillment in life blazed in the sun. Over the next few weeks, Rahim and I poked and probed and plumbed. We matched appendages to orifices in every combination that sprang to our fevered minds. Dispensing with the wrestling, we dove directly each evening into racking up the notches on the bedpost. Not to mention the sofa, the dining table, the kitchen stool, even the telephone stand before it broke. The arduousness of some of our experiments eased appreciably when we discovered the lubrication properties of pantry ingredients. Jam was too sticky. Butter worked better than mayonnaise, but nothing rivaled the glissants of pure ghee. My parents couldn't stop beaming. How eagerly I trotted off to class every evening, how well their mosque experiments seemed to be working. They even published a paper on this. Therapeutic self-affirmative effects of religious instruction on troubled youth soon after. The fact that I'd begun paying attention to my physique was an added bonus. Healthy mind, healthy body, just like the Quran says, my father remarked. Each morning he saw me performing calisthenics. In reality, roles had begun to emerge in my after-curricular activity. Clearly, I was the boinker, Rahim the eternal boinky. If I wanted to fit my emerging self-image, it behooved me to start pumping up. So that's jazz, and uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So jazz is, of course, you know, the most out there character I've ever written, and he was a completely so much fun to write, and you know, he's very, uh, he's very uh, snide and very snippy, and he's got a great, great sense of humor, and he's just out there. Um, and uh, after jazz was finally gelled in my mind, I still had the question of, and jazz is looking for his own lover in this book. So now the question was how to get these, all these ingredients together, the elephant, the, the pomegranate, this, jazz, everything. And you know, I'd got all these ingredients together, all I had to do was tie them up and I'd have this fantastic book. And I just couldn't do it. And these things, these strands kept you know, curling in front of me like snakes or something. And I just could not tie them together. And you know, the weeks went by, the months went by, the years went by. And I finally decided that I've, you know, I'm a mathematician. I should do something mathematical about this. So what I did was I started writing, I started making all these decision trees. Now you've probably seen these. They're used in uh, like chess games, for instance. You know, if black moves, uh, he, has, he or she has these three moves. For each of these moves, white can do this, this, or this. And then for each of those, you can have these alternatives. So you get this big tree, and you can sort of go down these different paths and try to optimize and try to find a solution. That's a well-known technique in mathematics. So I started doing the same thing with plot, plot structure. You know, this can happen, Jazz can do this, Sarita can do this, and everything. What I found was at, at each uh, juncture, I found that when I went down these paths, I would always come up with a blank wall. Either this was just completely trite, or it didn't make logical sense, or something else went wrong. And after a lot of experimentation, it finally struck me. Uh, what I had done was, I had proved mathematically that this book could not be written. <laughs> so you know, once, once I did that, I said, OK, my work is done, both as an author and as a mathematician. And I really set aside the book, and I started a different book. I said, I'm not going to waste time on this, because I've proved it can't be done. Now, uh, when I told my agent that, she's unfortunately not a mathematician. <laughs> she, could not, she could not appreciate my proof. Um, so she said, well, just, just you know, send it to me. I'll take a look at it. 
And so I said, okay, let me just uh, polish it up a little bit. And uh, when I started looking through it again, and you know, you might say, my God, this guy thinks he's a mathematician, this, that, and never struck him. But it finally struck me that I was writing this book about three characters, uh, and they were Jazz, and Karun, and uh, Sarita. <clears throat> and they really corresponded to, to the three main deities in Hinduism, where Karun was very much like Shiva. He was aloof and withdrawn. Jazz was full of energy, much like Vishnu. And Sarita was, well, I mean, by default, the mother goddess. And once that took place in my mind, I said, wow, that's, you know, that, that really gave this book uh, a depth that it did not have before. Once, once I got that depth, then it gave me a, a great amount of confidence to kind of surge on the way I wanted to. Uh, it also told me that these three characters really have to come together in some way, almost literally. Uh, and so that really set the ball rolling. And I could finally see a scene that I had to work towards. And I was able to complete the book. But what happened also in this process was that I had to really let go of all my preconceptions. You know, I had all this thing, well, I'm write, writing this literary novel. I have all this stuff going on. What are people going to think and this and that? I had to say, OK, I need to complete this book completely differently from the other two books. So I need to take, uh, I mean, I'm on this wild ride, and I need to take uh, all my readers along with me. So if you, if you read this book, you will, and you're looking for one of the other two books, it's nothing like that. So I'm more, I always warn people, because otherwise, you know, I get nasty comments on my Facebook page. So, so it's very different from the first two, and you kind of have to go along with it, just because it's a very different scenario. So I'm going to read you a section that really expresses that breaking out that I had. And uh, then after that, I'll take questions. So in this scene, uh, Sarita has uh, just jumped onto a train. And she's you know, trying to make her way north. And on this train, she meets, uh, she meets this, um, this um, guy, Mura, who is sort of mixed in with the bad guys. He's helping running the town. So I'll just read uh, what happens there. The train picks up speed. I keep my eyes averted out the window. Mura comes over and gazes with me at the houses going past. Only their tops are visible now, the rest obscured by a wall in between. I remember when I was a child, we used to ride the train every Sunday to visit my uncle in Goregaon. There weren't so many houses back then, or walls for that matter. At Santa Cruz, one could see all the way to the planes parked at the airport. He begins to caress the back of my neck. Did you grow up in the suburbs or the city? I brush his hand off my body, but he manages to latch onto my fingers. He buries his face into my hair and inhales deeply. Ah, that lovely fragrance convent schoolgirls have. Is it the shampoo or the soap or just that wealthy South Mumbai scent? Very educated, are you? College, probably. That's why you're not very impressed with our Devi. You mean you don't have a Devi? How devastating to hear that. This whole train and bridal charade you're putting us through and you don't even have a Devi? Oh, we have Devi, all right. Even better than the movies you'll see. The crowds worship her, even if convent girls like you don't believe. And you do believe that she'll protect us from the Pakistanis? That she'll open her heavenly parasol to block their bombs on the 19th? Mura draws back. Nothing's going to happen on the 19th. It's just a rumor the Pakistanis have been spreading to scare us. And what if you're wrong? What if the warnings are correct? They're not, but we are prepared for any eventuality. Mura comes closer again and runs a hand through my hair. So what do you say? In return for saving your life, surely you can agree to such a little thing. He leans forward to kiss me. I lay my palms on his chest and push him hard. He topples over easily, tumbling across the floor like a plump and comical baby. He gropes for his glasses and locates them underneath his own body. One of the arms has snapped off. How will I see with them now, he asks mournfully, staring at the piece in his hand. He rams his head into my back, knocking my breath out. Convent girls, do they all have to be so haughty? Please, he whispers. It's not too much. I can still detect the peanuts on his breath. I nod to buy time. 
but not on the floor, not like this. Surprised, he peers at me as if I'm lying. I give him a reassuring smile, as you put it, for saving my life. He helps me to my feet and leads me to the berths. I stall by prodding the cushions on each, pretending to look for the softest. I'm running out of ploys and moor out of patience when the undercarriage shudders. A sharp crack from below interrupts the steady rumble of wheels. Metal grinds noisily against metal. The compartment buckles and lifts. And to my disbelief, I see the wall outside the window closing in. I have just enough time to cover my face before we plow through, before a barrage of brick and mortar bursts in. The room tilts precariously around me, flinging me against a berth, then writes itself miraculously the instant before tipping. A line of building facades whizzes by. I realize the train has left its tracks and is thundering down the center of a road. Except that is not quite the center, but an angle at which we hurtle, an angle that brings us closer and closer to the building streaming past. We mount something, the edge of the sidewalk perhaps, and the jolt dislodges the pomegranate from its hiding place. It lifts off the floor and sails by my face, serene as a flying saucer, as I vainly try to snare it. I imagine myself airborne as well. The walls around me weightless, the train a rocket launching into space. At the moment of contact arrives, gravity gives us a pass, I imagine, and we rise above the buildings instead of crashing into them. The scrunching of metal, the splintering of wood, all the sickening sounds of impact surrounding me fade. We arc through the air, the compartments liberated from their earthly existence, our persons conveyed heavenward by the freed spirit of the train. I look down through the clouds at the long trail of Mumbai that stretches below us, from the string of suburbs unwinding north to Kolaba at its southernmost tip. For a moment, at our apex, everything is still. Then we begin our descent back to the city where Karun awaits. Thank you. So I'm uh, ready for questions. Hello. Hello, Hello. how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, when your first novel came out, uh, Death of Vishnu, uh, you had mentioned that you were going to write a trilogy. Mm -hmm. But of course, that was a preconceived notion which changed uh, with this novel. Yeah, so when, when that happened, after the first book came out, my agent one day asked me, well, the publishers want to hear what you'll be doing next. And so I thought to myself, you know, well, um, there's three main gods in Hinduism, uh, and they are actually Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. Brahma is the creator. And so I thought, OK, I can, make a, I can write a trilogy. And uh, I told her that. And um, then I thought to myself, it took me five years to write the first book. What have I got myself into? Uh, so I called her up, and I said, don't tell the publishers that. And she said, well, I've already told them, and they love the idea, so you are writing a trilogy whether you like it or not. So uh, after that first book, I just had one word to write my second book, and that was Shiva. It was like a homework assignment, a summer assignment. Go write an essay on that. Um, and then once that was done, you know, then it became time to write the Brahma book. And uh, right till about the middle of this book, I didn't know if it, I was thinking it's going to be something to do with Brahma, who's the creator. But the mother goddess really seemed to fit in much better uh, since Mumbai, as I said, uh, it became a trilogy more about Mumbai, and so you know she's really the patron goddess of the city, and she also represents creation. I mean, she's the one you know women give birth, so she does represent creation. She also represents destruction, which is also key to everything that's going on, and so uh, that's how it became uh, Devi instead of Brahma. And now, of course, I feel very guilty because I've left Brahma out in the cold. So I might have to write a fourth, a fourth book. I don't, know. Um, I don't know if I'll write it, but I have a great title for it. Uh, it's the Trinity Quartet. So it's perfect title. So. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I, um, I would need to qualify my question a little bit. Um, I realize that you probably are not um, a neurologist or a psychologist um, or a sociologist, but there's an opportunity for me to ask you a question, and it's not about your prose, uh, unfortunately. Thanks. 
Um, sorry. Um, but because you're a mathematician um, and a writer, an artist, I wonder if you've had any thoughts or you could talk about the process of, of both process of writing, the process of mathematics, sure. and your thinking, and your, uh, right. how the yeah. brain is. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, I'm going to donate my brain to science, so <laughs> they can, they can have, have whatever. But uh, just to answer your question, uh, I think that a lot of us, I mean, we all are capable of many things. And, uh, you know, it really depends on, um, like, how much time you put in and how much interest you have in something. So in that sense, I think we can all do things. And so some of it has to do with development, some of it has to do with interest. And uh, of course, I've been interested in both sides since I was a kid. And so maybe that's why things are easier to switch back and forth between. Uh, but I do feel that I uh, attack some of these writing problems more mathematically, where I'm always trying to uh, optimize, you know, find the best answer. Uh, so, so, and sometimes that gets too much, almost. Like, I'm always saying, well, this word isn't right. I need to find a better word. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, and that's, that's one of the reasons uh, I, I wrote that article in the, uh, in the New York Times, which really tells people that, hey, even if you're not a mathematician, you can actually appreciate math without knowing it. There are many ideas in math that you can, that don't involve calculation. So you can appreciate them. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I just came back from India where I spent about two years, and I've read wow. a lot of South Asian fiction. And, and I look at writers who write and, and are translated and writers who write in English. And I'm just curious, um, when you write, who do you think of as your audience? Are you thinking mainly of, of a kind of an international American European audience, English speaking audience? Or um, are you also kind of thinking of a, of a subcontinental audience? I mean, who, do you sure. even think of your audience? Maybe well, that's... yes, I do. Uh, I did for my first book, uh, where what I was doing was um, I was actually writing chapters and sending them to my mother. And uh, you know, I wrote the first chapter. She loved it. Then I wrote the second chapter, and there was silence. <laughs> and I finally asked her, why, you know, what's wrong? And she said, well, the first chapter was so much funnier. And so I thought, OK, I better make this book funny. If my own mother won't read it, that's pretty bad. <laughs> so, but then after the first book, uh, I mean, even while I was writing that first book, I used to go to a writing uh, uh, group in, in the US, in Washington. And um, you know, I was getting all this advice, which was, uh, take these things out, put them here. You know, What's going on? Where are we? Explain this, explain that. I finally realized that I just can't listen to this anymore, because it would just completely twist what I had written. So I just had to put that aside. And that was one of the luxuries of the first book, to be able to write without having to worry about that. Uh, when it came time to the second book, you know, I had this big audience in mind, so I had to worry about all these people, about disappointing them, about fulfilling their ideas of what they wanted. And I had to, again, th th this becomes harder now to really push that away. But I always try to think, OK, uh, good fiction should perhaps really uh, be something that you know will appeal to not just India or other places. And these books have been you know they've been translated into many languages and they've been doing pretty well in India. So I think I have managed that balance. So I think we have time for one more question. If anyone uh, has a question, okay. Doctor Suri, um, yes. uh, I haven't read the latest book, but uh, from what you have described it, it's a rather bleak view of uh, nuclear war, uh, AK-47s all around, and uh, uh, dirty bombs. So how do you manage to create this hopeful message that uh, goes throughout the book, as I understand it, to reach a conclusion that would not have been uh, expected, considering sure. the scenario you have set up. Right, right. No, that's a good question. Uh, and um, I think humor really helps. Like Jazz's character was great because, and even Sarita has some, you know, great one-liners. So the humor is what I need to keep myself reading through the book. And uh, there's a sense of absurdity. So you can you can really talk about a dystopian future and say, oh, this is so dark and everything. But here, I think in India, things are always so absurd. 
So on the one hand, there's tragedy, but on the other hand, there's comedy. So like all some of these characters go around searching for cell phones. You know, there's this little girl from the village who's always picking up cell phones, even though they don't work anymore. So it's little touches like that that you try to make it more human, and you try to make it you know so that people will actually react, um, and they will keep reading. That's the most important thing. And then you have to give people hope. You know, if I'm going to write a Brahma book, I need something to go right at the end, so that there is something for Brahma to do. So, so yeah, there's some elements of hope as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.